Okay. Um, welcome, everyone, to the Concussion Prevention Poster Session for the inaugural University of Michigan Injury Prevention Center Research Symposium. My name is Steve Brolio. I'm the director of the Michigan Concussion Center, and I'll be moderating this session today. Uh, thank you to everyone for taking part of their day to join us. We're very happy that uh, you chose to be with us. A couple of housekeeping matters uh, to address here on the front end. Just as a reminder, the session is being recorded uh, and only the presenters and the moderator will be visible during that time. Chat is also disabled, so if you have any uh, questions, please use uh, the Q&A feature at the bottom. Uh, if you have a question for one of our presenters, uh, feel free to ask it by typing it into the Q&A feature at the bottom. At any time, uh, just be sure to indicate which speaker so we can direct the questions towards them when we get to the Q&A session. Uh, the Q&A session will take place after all the abstracts have been presented. Uh, we do, we, we, but we will, excuse me, we encourage you to send in questions throughout the session uh, so we have a chance to review them and we might uh, be able to combine if there are multiple people asking the same question on a theme. Uh, and we will answer as many questions as we have time for uh, once all the presentations are done. Each of our present, uh, presenters uh, will have about four minutes to present their poster and we'll share their poster slide while they are presenting but you can also access their posters and the abstracts uh, at this following website. Uh, it's injurycenter.umich.edu slash research hyphen symposium hyphen 2020. Uh, there are five other poster sessions occurring at this time. And of course, we want you to stay here for the entire time and listen to uh, the awesome presentations we have for you. But please feel free to jump between sessions if there's something else of interest to you. Uh, and the recordings of all these sessions will be released in the coming weeks. Okay, so uh, please join me now in welcoming uh, all of our poster uh, presenters. I'm gonna introduce everybody now, uh, so as not to interrupt the flow once the presentations begin. So please join me in welcoming, uh, we have Jai Chen Liu from the Department of Industrial and Operations Engineering from the University of Michigan. Dr. Abby Bretson from the Department of Biostatistics, Epidemiology and Informatics at the University of Pennsylvania. Bernadette Delonzo, also from the Department of Biostatistics, Epidemiology and Informatics from the University of Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania. Colin Huber from the Department of Bioengineering, University of Pennsylvania and Center for Injury Research and Prevention at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. Dr. Douglas Weeb from the Department of Biostatistics, Epidemiology and Informatics at the University of Pennsylvania. Dr. Tricia Robbie from the Center for Injury Research and Prevention at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. Divya Jane from the Department of Bioengineering at the University of Pennsylvania. And lastly, Dr. Cesar Ruben Bolas Olmos from the School of Medicine at the University of Colima. Okay, appreciate everybody and excited for these presentations. We will get started. Okay, so thanks for the introduction. My name is Jia Cheng, and it's my great honor to present a work about a head injury assessment considering human diversity. To begin with, let's talk about that. why do we need this research. Currently, sport concussion is a major public health problem in the US and worldwide. It is beneficial for us to understand the injury biomechanics of concussion for reliable assessment. The morphological variations exist in human skull and brain with multiple sizes and shapes could cause very different injury risks for people among the population. Like male and female or people with different ages could have definitely different injury risks. However, current injury biomechanics field focuses primarily on the mid-sized male, only one size model to represent the whole population, ignoring those variations. To address this issue, our study evaluated tissue level impact responses on a large number of people among youth and young adults. Then I will go through our methodology step by step. Why can we use more models than the previous studies? This question can be answered by the first two steps of building finite element models. Finite element model is a state-of-art computational tool to represent the human model with different properties to estimate the localized response accurately. But it is time consuming to generate such models in the previous work. However, we generate a rapid framework to build accurate FE model by morphing a baseline model to the target subject, which takes only minutes or even seconds. So now we have the capability to obtain a large set of high quality FE models 
And in this case, we used 101 subjects accounting for the morphological variations comparing to just one size model to run the impact simulations later. The helmet was fitted on a baseline model to obtain the head impact kinematics and the rear, oblique, and side impact conditions. The tissue level impact responses, which is a maximum principal strain, were collected for each subject. Statistical analysis was then applied to those screen values using the subject covariate like age, gender, or lines, and the geometric covariate like brain volume. So now let's see the results in the middle. We found different maximum principal strain concentrated regions in those heated plots marked as different labels under three impact conditions. Different strain distributions and concentrated regions show the influence of the morphological variations on the injury responses. Because of those variations, the strain concentrated regions can be uh, different for different people. And we can find such relationship seeing the covariates like BMI and age are significantly different between the groups with different concentration regions. And uh, if we look at the red figure, we evaluate brain volume as an important geometric covariate to assess the morphological variations in the statistical analysis which was rarely considered in previous studies. According to this figure, strain and volume show some positive relationships. And in the table below, uh, we can see that R square values show good predictability to predict the, the, the strain values using the covariates. And then we draw three conclusions. So the first one is impact strain responses show a positive relationship with brain volume, indicating the influence of the morphological variations. Second, the linear regression models show the potential to predict the concussion risk based on individual's morphological features. Um, and the different maximum principal strain concentrated regions provide useful information to explore brain injury mechanisms in the future. That's all, thank you. Hello, thank you for having me today. Um, my study is looking at the sex differences in sport-related concussion mechanisms, and we're currently using data from the Ivy League Big Ten Epidemiology of Concussion Study. Um, like outlined in the previous talk, uh, sport-related concussion is assumed assumed risk of participation in collegiate sports, and the burden of concussion within collegiate sports has been estimated to occur in over 10,000 um, student athletes annually. And so therefore it's important to start to look at ways that we can prevent these um, injuries from happening. And one of those ways is potentially investigating mechanisms of injury or the cause of the injury. And then further, we can examine uh, the mechanisms that are different or similar between males and females participating in a given sport. So our purpose of this study was to describe the mechanism of injury for sport-related concussion and sex differences within four contact sports within the Ivy Big Ten study. So for our procedures, athletic trainers um, help to identify and enroll student athletes into our prospective cohort study. And throughout the study, we collect information on the injury and how it occurred and also recovery outcomes um, along their um, injury progression. And within this particular study, we focused on four sports, uh, water polo, soccer, lacrosse, and basketball, because they have both male and female participants, and they have similarities and differences in rule changes um, or equipment or uh, participation and style of play between each sport. Um, and as you can see, it would included within this study is approximately 700 student athletes that had sustained a concussion from 2013-14 through the 2019-20 athletic seasons. Um, so within this figure, we have a breakdown of the number of people participating that sustained a concussion within each sport, and further it's broken down into the percentages of males and females within each sport. Um, also, our, our main outcome of interest was the mechanism of injury. And so within our study or database, we have a detailed descriptive explanation of how the injury occurred that's uh, uh, provided by both the student athlete and the athletic trainer that's um, obtaining the information. And so 
Within the mechanism of injury for each of these four sports, we uh, provide we um, coded common occurrences of how the injury occurred and developed profiles that were common to each individual sport or each sport individually. And you can see that these profiles differ between sports um, in this nice little results section. So within basketball, we do find um, a significant association between um, sex and the mechanism mechanism of injury overall. You can see that a greater proportion of males sustain a concussion from a person where a greater proportion of females sustain a concussion from contact with the surface. Um, but within each sport, you can see there are, are, are different mechanisms that occur. In lacrosse, you can see there's a combination of person and ground ball um, or just person alone. And so it's important to look at these sports individually. But also within lacrosse, um, you can see that a greater proportion of males sustain an injury from contact where, with a person, whereas females, um, their most common concussion injury or risk was caused, well not risk, <laughs> was caused by contact with the ball. Um, and so basketball, soccer, and lacrosse all had significant um, differences between sexes. Um, however, water polo, uh, males and females were obtaining concussion or sustaining their concussion from similar mechanisms. Um, so it's important to kind of look at these mechanisms differently across sports and within teams, male and female teams within each sport, because then we can start to shape preventative efforts and try to decrease that burden of injury that's sustained within sports. Um, so in the future, I think it's important that we start to look at um, these sports differently and, and start to find ways that we can make sports safer and, and stop those concussions from happening. Thank you. Hello everyone. Um, my name is Bernadette Delonzo. It's it's such a pleasure to be uh, talking with you all today and, and be a part of this panel. Um, the study that I'm going to be talking with you uh, with you all today is actually related to the study that Dr. Bretson was just referring to, the Ivy League Big Ten Epidemiology of Concussion Study. Um, however, I'm going to be talking about symptom profiles, severity, and recovery just among our football athletes in that study. Um, so to start out with a bit of a background. Um, we all know that really athletes present and experience uh, various types of symptoms following sport-related concussion. Um, and there is some evidence uh, to suggest that differences in symptom presentation may have an impact on, on recovery and, and timing of recovery uh, through different outcomes in their return to learn and return to play protocol. Um, concussion reporting though is also suggested to vary by gender, contact, non-contact, and sport. Uh, and it's really exciting um, that as a result of having this large database um, that Abby was just talking about, um, that we have a large enough sample within our football athletes to, to, to study some of these questions um, and investigating this uh, phenomena within a sport with high incidence of concussion is really warranted. And so we're able to do that here with our football athletes. Um, so the purpose of this study was to explore difference in symptom type and time to symptom resolution among a large cohort of collegiate football athletes. So these are athletes, uh, football athletes across um, 19 uh, Ivy League and Big Ten universities that are participating campuses in the larger Ivy Big Ten study. Um, so as a part of this study, the athletic trainers enroll, identify athletes with concussion and enroll them in the study. Um, we do collect on 28 sports, but again, um, these analyses for the purposes of this study are just with football athletes. Um, we collect and record, I'm sorry, the athletic trainers collect and record data, including uh, symptoms from the SCAT-3 uh, and the dates that the athletes return through return to learn and return to play. Um, today, I'm just going to be focusing on symptom resolution as the recovery outcome defined as days between injury and resolution of symptoms. Um, the data source itself, um, I mentioned this before, it's a large, large amount of data uh, as of uh, the, the data pool that I did for these analyses was back in June, um, but the cases accrued are through March 2020. So again, these are our um, concussions in football athletes through March 2020, um, going back to 2013. Um, the analyses for this study, uh, a few descriptive statistics that I'll go through in a moment. Then um, I performed exploratory factor analysis to identify symptom domains. 
um, when you split those domains into high, uh, those athletes who are high and low endorsers of those domains, um, you're um, able to do a uh, survival analysis and look at time to symptom resolution by high low endorsers of a given symptom profile type. Um, and then we just ran a quick logistic regression and looked at whether or not a symptom domain is really um, associated with symptom resolution in 14 days. And you can see the results there in that pain there. So looking quickly at symptom prevalence, we see you know, the highest, uh, the most common symptoms reported being headache, um, don't feel like, right pressure in the head, uh, just to get you, give you an idea of what symptom prevalence looks like in this population. For co-occurrence of sport-related concussion symptoms, we had five domains emerge, which we named emotional, foggy, groggy, vestibular, and remember, headache and light and noise sensitivity, pressure and neck pain. And again, when you split, um, you can split each of those domains into high and low endorsers. And when you look here in figure three in the upper right, um, this is a survival analysis, symptom resolution by symptom profile type. You see this really rather beautiful <laughs> dose response um, emerge here, uh, where median number of days, um, which I noted in the upper right there, um, two days for those endorsing high on one of the domains, all the way up to a median of 13 days for those who endorsed high on all five domains. Um, do we see that symptom domain is, is predictive of uh, or associated with symptom resolution in 14 days? Um, not entirely, you know, I think we'd like to see that area under the curve a little bit higher, closer to 0.8. Um, I think a lot of what could be accounting for this, and of course, many on the phone who are familiar working with athletes with sport-related concussion, that concussion management is really a crucial piece of this. Um, by identifying um, modifiable symptom domains, uh, we can begin to look at tailoring treatment to a given athlete. So if we know an athlete is endorsing an emotional domain, maybe that's time to get a counselor involved, a sports psychologist. If this is a vestibular domain, have neck strength treatment involved. Um, and, and we can kind of go from there. But again, I think this is exciting um, to be exploring this and, and symptom profiles. But again, keeping in mind um, uh, what we can do with this information and, and how we can predict timing to recovery uh, from that. So that is all for me and looking forward to taking your questions at the end. Hi, thank you guys all for joining. Uh, my name is Colin Huber and I'm a researcher at the Minds Matter Concussion Program at Children's Hospital Philadelphia and a PhD student at the University of Pennsylvania. And so there is growing concern uh, for uh, competitive head impacts that in sports that may cause short and long-term neurological effects. And with the rapid increase in the number of studies looking at head impacts in sports, uh, there's been various methods to calculate that head impact exposure. So the objective of this study was to compare those different uh, methods for calculating head impact rate uh, and compare specifically in male and female high school soccer. Uh, more specifically, we use the TriX SIMG headband mounted sensor to quantify head impacts in competitive games over two seasons of uh, high school varsity soccer. Uh, all sensor recorded events were reviewed on video to confirm head impact events. And we identified four main methods to quantify periods of exposure. So the first two are based on athlete exposures, a uh, common metric often in large epidemiological studies. So the first is presence, uh, where a player is just on the roster and present at the game. And then the second is participation, uh, where we specified if an athlete entered and actively played in the game. And the next two methods were based on time. So the first scheduled time uh, is a theoretical account of the total exposure for a team. So an 80 minute high school game uh, multiplied by 11 players on the field at a time, uh, 880 minutes of total exposure time. And then the second was individual play time where we track substitutions and uh, accounted for each individual's amount of time on the field. Uh, as we move into the results, uh, we studied 54 total participants uh, over 41 games. We recorded uh, 9,000 events of which uh, 1,300 were video confirmed head impact events. And so on the first figure, uh, we compare the rates per presence and participation for males and females. Uh, in both methods, uh, the male rate was around twice as high as females. 
And then when comparing the rate participation versus presence, it was higher for males, but not in the females teams. Uh, we think this is likely related to the size of the team as the male team had a larger team. So there were consistently more players that uh, didn't participate. And then in the next figure in the top right, uh, we compared scheduled time to play time. Uh, again, in both of these methods, uh, males had a rate around twice as high as females. Uh, and then when comparing play time to scheduled time uh, for both males and females, the rate was higher. Uh, this was expected as uh, scheduled time makes the assumption uh, that all players were enrolled in the study and actively wearing a sensor uh, at all times. And then in the third uh, figure at the bottom right, we highlight how exposure can vary within a team. So for both males and females, around 15 to 25% of the uh, team had no impacts throughout the season. Uh, and to configure you to violin plots, the width here indicates how many uh, participants had that head impact rate. And so then you can also notice that uh, just a few handful of players accounted for more than 50% of the total impact sustained by the team. And so our major conclusions for the study are that uh, high school males had higher head impact rates in soccer than females. And then uh, the second is your calculation method significantly affects uh, your total head impact exposure rate. And so therefore future studies should be careful and clearly define their exposure rates so that we can compare sports across states. Thank you. Thanks to Dr. Brolio and to the organizers for the chance to be here. Thanks for everyone, to, everyone for coming. You can see that I represent a large multidisciplinary group of investigators here. Please have a look at all of the collaborators and the leadership um, on this group um, under the title. Our, here's our motivation. It, it's well understood that there are validated measures for assessing symptoms following concussion. The one that we used in this, in this study was the PCSI, post-concussion uh, symptom inventory. However, there are not agreed upon uh, definitions for symptom recovery following concussion. And also relying on patients to report their symptoms um, is fraught with challenges because, because symptoms can be fleeting. So we took advantage of an opportunity here, which was a large multi-site randomized trial that was led by um, Dr. John Letty at University of Buffalo. And it is funded by the AMSSM, the American S Medical Society for Sports Medicine. Um, enrollment has just concluded in that study and analyses are underway to test whether or not um, sub, um, sub, sub threshold um, exercise was protective following concussion. And we use the data for a different investigation here. Um, we wanted to look at um, different measures of symptom recovery as patients were monitored for two weeks following concussion and look at the reliability and validity of those measures and compare the timing of symptom recovery to recovery as defined based uh, on standard of care, which in this study was each participant um, attended an in-person clinic visit every week and um, were monitored until they had um, symptoms returned to their baseline level um, where they cleared a physical exam and, um, and they also tolerated the Buffalo concussion uh, treadmill test. So we used a method of following these, uh, the athletes recruited for this study in real time that we call RECOOPS, the Recovery and Concussion Update on the Progression of Symptoms. 118 athletes were enrolled in the study, ages 13 to 18, about two thirds male, one third female, and were monitored for two weeks and then really a month and more uh, following concussion. And um, each individual downloaded an app onto their phone and was prompted three times a day to report their concussions on the PCSI in real time. 
Those are 21 symptoms, each of each symptom on a scale from zero to six. And here's what we found. Um, starting during follow-up, we found very good correspondence. It's the box on the top left with that result figure. Very good correspondence and so good uh, test retest reliability between symptoms reported in clinic in person and symptoms reported into the app um, during the same day. So the app seemed to be saying what, what, uh, what athletes said when, when they were um, in the clinic. And then the results figures, those, those ones on the top right, they were showing that there was great correspondence between two of our measures um, of symptom recovery in real time and not with another measure. And, and here's how we measured symptom recovery. One of the measures was looking at each participant um, and monitoring to see when their symptoms came back down specifically to have no more than two of the PCSI symptoms that they had at baseline. So down to just about as many symptoms as you had when you were healthy at baseline. The other one was just a total score on PCSI getting down to within three points of your original pre-injury PSI, PCSI score. And then the third ignored pre-existing symptoms and just looked at a, a cutoff of a PCSI score of eight or below. And what we saw was that um, the first two measures of symptom recovery really came on about the same day. And both of those measures came um, a number of days after um, um, symptom recovery measured when, it, when uh, pre-existing symptoms were not factored in. So it was important to consider um, pre-existing symptoms. Um, further, when we monitored in real time compared to the clinic, we did see that um, subjects were experiencing symptom recovery a number of days before they experienced in-clinic recovery, um, which is not surprising because symptoms may have been um, relatively low and yet athletes had to wait to get into the clinic to get cleared. And that's also what the survival curve shows with medium follow-up times, a medium time to recovery of 14 days for being cleared in the clinic and between nine and 10 days for the other methods of follow-up. So ultimately we found that monitoring in real time with EMA um, seemed to work reliably and validly, or validly. And also it was val valuable to account for pre-existing symptoms when we were monitoring athletes and waiting for them to see when they became asymptomatic. It was important to do that relative to symptoms that were pre-existing. So we see the potential to use this in the clinic to help inform um, guidance before athletes uh, are seen again in person. Thank you. Um, all right, well, thank you all for joining me. I'm Trisha Roby. I'm a postdoctoral research fellow with the Center for Injury Research and Prevention at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. And I'll be presenting on visio-vestibular function of pediatric patients presenting with the first concussion versus a recurrent concussion. So we all know that use of visual and vestibular assessment to diagnose and manage concussion is growing. An examination of these outcomes have been uh, impairments have been demonstrated in both the acute and the subacute phases following injury, but it's currently unknown how concussion history may affect these outcomes, particularly following a subsequent injury. And so the purpose of this study was to investigate visio vestibular examination outcomes in high school age patients presenting with their first concussion versus those presenting with a recurrent concussion. To do this, we looked at prospectively collected data from our electronic health records for patients presenting for an initial injury visit to specialty concussion care centers. We included patients aged 14 to 18 presenting within 28 days of their injury. Demographic information was self-reported prior to the start of the exam. The visio-vestibular exam, uh, abbreviated as the VVE, consisted of nine maneuvers, smooth pursuits, horizontal and vertical saccades, horizontal and vertical gaze stability, binocular convergence, left and right monocular accommodation, and complex tandem gait. Descriptions of what was considered an abnormal test are listed in table one. Our dependent variables included age at visit and self-reported lifetime concussions, which were dichotomized into one versus two plus, 
Our independent variables included these VBE subtests scored as normal or abnormal and total VBE score, which was defined as two or more abnormal subtests. We used multivariable log logistic regression to determine if recurrent concussion was associated with abnormal VBE outcomes while controlling for age. Table two presents demographic information for our sample, which included 1,052 patients that were about 15 and a half years old. The recurrent concussion group were presenting with a median of three lifetime concussions and days post-injury were similar for both groups. Figure one in the middle of my poster presents a summary of the percent of patients testing abnormally on VBE subtests and the total VBE score stratified by first versus recurrent concussion. For both groups, the highest proportion of abnormal tests occurred during saccades and gaze stability. However, you can see by comparing the white and blue bars at each subtest and the total VBE score, the proportions are relatively equal. This is demonstrated statistically in table three, which shows that when controlling for age, there were no significant associations between first versus recurrent concussion and our VBE outcomes on any subtest or total score. Our findings suggest that despite varying concussion histories, high school age patients present similarly, or they present similar visuovestibular function following a subsequent injury. This study provides novel insight into the effect of concussion history on visio-vestibular outcomes following an, an additional concussion and adds formative data regarding the cumulative clinical effects of concussion in youth athletes. Thank you. Hi, um, my name is Divya Jain. I'm a PhD candidate at the University of Pennsylvania and the Center for Injury Research and Prevention at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. And today I'll be talking about cognitive dysfunction in concussed adolescents during driving tests. So adolescents account for the majority of the nearly 2 million pediatric concussions that occur in the U.S. annually. A major leading cause of death in adolescents is motor vehicle crash. Now, the neurocognitive deficits that arise from a concussion can affect things like memory, concentration, and processing speed. Now, as you can imagine, deficits in those areas can affect driving-related tests. So clearly, adolescents are a population that are at high risk for concussion. They're at high risk for motor vehicle crash, and yet few studies have explored how a concussion affects driving behaviors in adolescents. Thus, the goal of this study was to explore how concussed adolescents manage the cognitive demands of driving. To do so, we employed the use of a device known as functional near infrared spectroscopy, or FNIRS, shown here on the bottom left. And this portable device that sits on the forehead of a participant emits light in the near infrared window to determine increases in brain activity in response to a functional task. In particular, we have this on the forehead of our participants because we were interested in monitoring activation in the prefrontal cortex, which is a region of the brain that's intricately linked to cognit cognitively complex tasks, like driving. So we recruited both healthy and concussed licensed adolescents to complete a validated simulated driving assessment while wearing this FNIRS device. And for this particular analysis, we compared two driving tasks from that assessment. The first was a simple driving task of just driving straight with no traffic, and the second was a more complex driving task of texting while simultaneously completing a left turn. And so for these two tasks, we gathered information on prefrontal cortical activation via FNIRS and also looked at standard driving metrics like mean standard deviation of lane position, so how much you're moving in your lane, and mean speed. We use linear mixed effects model to understand how both the diagnosis of a concussion and the complexity of the driving scenario affected these outcome measures. So we were able to successfully recruit five healthy and seven concussed adolescents all about a year into licensure, and none of them threw up in the simulator. And so if we look at these results, um, across all three of these graphs, all of our blue bars indicate our concussed adolescent's behavior, and all of the green bars indicate our healthy adolescent's behavior. So if we look in particular at that first graph all the way on the left, you'll see that both groups had a significantly higher standard deviation of lane position during that more complex task of texting while driving in comparison to that simple task of just driving with no traffic. And we think this is because they had to take at least one hand off the wheel in order to be able to send that text message leading to decreased vehicular control. Now, if we look at that middle graph, which is looking at mean, mean speed, we see the same pattern. There's no differences between groups, but both healthy and concussed adolescents drove significantly slower during that complex task of texting and driving. And again, we think this is because they were focusing on their phone rather than the forward roadway. And as a result, we're slowing down. Now, if we look at that final graph all the way on the right, that's looking at our prefrontal cortical activation. So how hard the brain is working. So let's just hone in on that simple task for a second. 
it doesn't look like our concussed kids are really that different from our healthy kids. They're working at about the same level. But if we look at that more complex task, um, we see that our concussed kids are working significantly harder in that complex task of texting while driving in comparison to our healthy adolescents. And all of that extra work is just to achieve that same level of driving performance. So this study provides some initial evidence that concussed adolescents have increased recruitment of the prefrontal cortex to complete a complex driving task at the same level as their healthy counterparts. And this could suggest that in a real world driving scenario, concussed adolescents may be at a higher risk of cognitive overload, potentially leading to a higher risk for driving errors. Future work should include the investigation of other kinds of driving tasks and the role of other clinical metrics like symptom burden and time since injury on the management of the cognitive demands of driving. Thanks. Hello, good morning for everybody. I'm going to present my research. The title is The Cognitive Effects of Repetitive Head Impact in Mexican Collegial Contact Sport Athletes. Uh, well, first, in the, regarding to the background, uh, we know due the contact sport practice has been rising worldwide. According to the previous study, the head impact contact, contact uh, while playing contact sports may lead to, to a variety of worries and outcomes even and the increase uh, to the susceptibility to uh, the second conclusion and the chronic traumatic encephalopathy risk, uh, change in the brain, in the brain connectivity, with just transition in the contact sport, even when the player is no outward things of a conclusion, including a neurocognitive deficit and a brain made change uh, that is possible to identify by a magnetic resonance imaging. Regarding to the objective, we have to determine the effects of contact sport practice on cognitive performance in collegiate at sport athletes. The, the methods or the methodology uh, we have uh, to participants were 30 collegiate soccer players and 30 oh. non-contact uh, collegiate sport athletes who have uh, practiced these sports along six months on the rugby. Peers, we have a meeting, meeting with them to, the, to invent to participate in the research. After we have a clinical history for, for now that these players uh, accomplish the selection criteria. And posteriorly, we have a physical evaluation and bio impedance scale uh, to know the physical state of having the for each players. And finally, we have a cognitive assessment using the software, Cox State software, via an electronic device. Regarding to the results, uh, we divide uh, these participants in the exposed groups and unexposed groups. Regarding to the social demographic and anthropometric uh, characteristics for two groups, uh, we don't have uh, any significant difference regarding to the age, the education level, the weight, the e index, max index, the body fat percent. We don't find, we don't find uh, any difference. Regarding to the sport habits, uh, we divide the sport habits in the time or the years of that this uh, each player has been player this sport and the hours by week that practice these sports. Uh, we have we don't have uh, any difference um, in two parameters. And finally, regarding to the cognitive assessment, we evaluate uh, regard to the cog state. We have we found three different significant regarding to the psychomotor speak, regarding to the executive function and the working memory in 3 this function. Uh, we have found um, worse performance regard for the contact sport or exposed groups uh, to the soccer players. And the visual learning and the visual memory and the attention function, we don't found uh, any significant difference. The performance for both groups was uh, similar. Regarding to the conclusion and the innovation and significance of the fields, uh, the repeated head impacts for these players may negatively, negatively impact associated with peer learning, the working memory, and attention function in collegiate athletes, even when they are no outward things of unknown injury or even um, we out and things of on conclusion. Uh, the evidence has shown that these impacts, we on conclusion, we on TBA record has a relationship, while long term health problems uh, as a cognitive 
deficit, inclusion and persist decline in cognitive functioning, emotional deficits, and the, and the potential to develop a long-term neuro neurological disorders. It's all. Thank you for everyone. Okay, well, thank you uh, to all of our speakers uh, for a great session. It looks like they're coming back in and turning cameras on. Uh, we do have some time for questions. Um, if anyone in the audience would like to submit a question, uh, I'll just remind you if you can uh, do it through the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. Uh, just please be sure to indicate which speaker you would like me to direct the question toward. Um, I have some prepared as our audience members are getting uh, queued up. Uh, so I will um, I'll start at the top here. Um, Jai Chun, um, it, it, wouldn't, it wouldn't be practical to do um, brain, like volume scans, structural scans on athletes um, to pick specialized protective equipment, something like specialized helmets, conceivably based on size or position mm -hmm. that they play. Um, so what do you see as uh, the application of uh, clinical application for the work that you're doing? Um, so basically, I think it, it is quite beneficial for us to first uh, find some way to measure those uh, morphological variations or consider the morphological variations in the injury assessment. Because mm -hmm. now we determine that it is very important uh, for the injury risks. Mm -hmm. And um, so, and also, so based on our linear regression model, we can just use some covariates like age, gender, stature, or some local measurements like the bright lines and treatment to top of the head um, to quantify those injury risks. And uh, so, and also if we can have some CT scans, even with low resolution of the CT scans, we can just estimate those volume or we have other studies um, for to, to uh, extract some PC scores using the principal component analysis from those CT scans um, to, uh, uh, predict for the string values. And that one actually is more accurate. So, and probably quantify some uh, 80 or 90 variation of the injury risks. So I think um, in either way, we could definitely improve um, the, the accuracy of the injury assessment based on our current study, yeah. Okay. And then uh, a little bit, if I was understanding your, your figures correctly, when you did the FEA analysis, it looked like, de depending on the location of impact, you found different areas of stress. Yes. That, sorry. Mm -hmm. So that, that differs a bit from, I'm thinking some of the work that's come out of Stanford, which really shows, uh, at least my understanding of it, is it shows kind of this, the main stress point is the corpus callosum. Um, can you maybe talk about the, the difference between what you found and maybe some of these other papers that have been published? Uh, okay, so... Uh, I, I I can now. Can, could could you uh, share my uh, poster or uh, I don't uh, know. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So so uh, so actually, uh, you can see that for different since we have three impact conditions: the rear oblique and the side impact. So actually, so the, uh, the for the uh, side impact condition, most of the maximal principal strain would locate it in the corpus callosum. Mm -hmm. And uh, we think that the reason is due to the high rigidness of the fox. So we will have a very concentrated area in the corpus callosum. I think that's what you mean. It is very uh, similar to the other studies results. But uh, when we look at uh, some results from uh, the previous studies, since they do not have uh, like the capability to quantify so a large side of subjects, so perhaps they only find um, some of the concentrated areas uh, for like the uh, a rear impact. They only like find, okay, the top or the middle is very important, but they cannot quantify why um, we have uh, different concentrated regions for different person. I think that's the most important uh, difference, yeah. Okay, great, yeah. thank you, appreciate that. Um, Abby, I want to turn over to your to your study. Very interesting. I, I noted, um, particularly with in the lacrosse section, the male female differences that uh, women had a very high number of concussions relative um, ball to head. Con it just said ball, or I think it's a ball or equipment, but presumably ball to head, um, it, which is is not entirely unexpected, just because women in the women's lacrosse game they don't wear helmets. Um, 
because of that, is now the time or is there a need to push for, for the helmets to be implemented to the women's game? Um, I think that's a, kind of a loaded question in a sense because there, <laughs> it's more than just the just the ball like hitting the head. It's it's the why as well. And I think there goes a lot of, of style of play issues too. Um, so I think it's now the time to study more if helmets should be in place. Um, but I think there's other factors than just saying um, a ball gets hit in the head, so we should give them a helmet. But I think it's it's time to look at like different issues within lacrosse. And, and I think thinking about male and female lacrosse separately is, is really important also. So, so what other issues, a follow up, what other issues should be considered? So a ball to head was one, I mean, stick to head, I'm sure is another scenario. Um, what other issues should be considered in this conversation? Yeah, so I mean, in female and male lacrosse, they differ in terms of how they carry the stick and ball overall. So females tend to carry it closer to their head. So if they're throwing towards the stick, then the ball might be more likely to hit the head if okay. they miss. So I think I think style of play is also an important issue to be included. And just looking at male versus female differences overall. So if females are getting hit in the head more with the ball or the same amount with the ball, but one is resulting in a concussion and one's not. And think of reasons why that way too, biologically and um, mechanically. Okay. And, and if we were to, sorry, last follow-up, I promise. <laughs> um, and, and so if we go down this road, so uh, the conversation around helmets and, and women's lacrosse is, I mean, a decade or more old. Um, I was very happy to see when they implemented the eyewear, um, which kind of dates me a bit because I remember when they didn't have eyewear, but that's beside the point. Um, but if we, if helmets are added to the women's game, are there, is there the potential for downside, downside effects, you know, with that being part of uh, standard equipment? I think there, like, there is a potential for a downside. I mean, the whole gladiator effect with adding a helmet could um, increase um, aggressive behavior, which has kind of been shown. But I think there are there are ways to kind of study that before it's implemented, or look at people who it has been implemented in, just looking at um, larger databases and and recording of the equipment that they've worn to see if that would be a factor. Okay. Great. Thanks. Uh, I'm going to move on to Bernadette. Um, so Bernadette, uh, amazing work, of course. Um, I noticed on your your um, your EFA model, like your groupings, um, one of the categories you had, I might get this wrong, but it was headache and light sensitivity were grouped. Is that, am I getting that correct? So those don't, in my mind at least, they don't really go together conceptually. Could you maybe, is there a conceptual grouping there that maybe I'm missing um, or, or something you can add or? So I, and I, I probably, I can't speak to this clinically at all. I think that's an interesting question because we do see those, like this was with exploratory analysis, we do see those two emerge together uh, and cluster together. I, I don't know about an underlying mechanism. I think okay. it's in question. <laughs> right, right, right. So this kind of, this is a, like, so a follow on to that then is like, there, there've been some calls and, and some published work to really try to truncate the symptom list because there are, there's a lot of noise, right? Like there's a lot of, there's a lot of items on the, the standard symptom list that um, are not specific to concussion, right? Um, and so there's been calls to kind of reduce or start to eliminate some of these things um, to reduce the noise that's in there. But your work kind of goes opposite of that, right? It seems like the, the more things you have available, the more you can predict uh, recovery trajectories and that sort of thing. So can you maybe try to balance those two schools of thought? Yeah, absolutely. That's a really interesting question. Um, I think uh, if you had asked me when I began working on this, uh, the whole project two or three years ago, if I thought it was a good idea that we reduced <laughs> the symptom list, because some of them were subjective, I would have said, absolutely. Like, how are you going to measure that? Don't feel right. Difficult to concentrate. <laughs> are these symptoms that we're going to see or that we are seeing? Um, yes, in, in, in non-athletes. Uh, but I, I think they need to stay in there. It's important because of the point that you just made, um, that it may not be about endorsing the specific, like one specific symptom, but the way that they cluster together. Um, and I, yeah, I think that's incredibly important. I think the instrument should stay at, as is. The, the one thing I wanted to, to, um, to kind of jump off, off of that though, is you make an interesting point that this is exploratory factor analysis. Right. One of the, um, 
one of the directions I'm hoping to take this, and I've done some preliminary analysis in this already, is to do confirmatory first. And so to be looking at how um, within the same population, well, we can do this with our athletes, um, how, the, how, the, you know, how they, they group into the pre -exist, some of the pre-existing profiles that have already been established and the domains that have already been established, and then look at how that difference and reconcile some of those differences um, and then look at the, how they present in the exploratory analysis. And so I think right. that's an important step that a lot of folks haven't taken. Yeah, haven't sure. at, so. Okay, very cool. Excited to see the next steps. Yeah. Uh, Colin, I want to move on to yours. Um, very interesting stuff. I, I, you may know I've done a, a bit of uh, head impact exposure work in uh, high school football. So glad to see that, um, and we did that because it was helmet-based sensors and we really didn't have much of a choice, but glad to see you going into the soccer space can you maybe talk about, um, you know, you have this lower exposure, no matter kind of which way you sliced it amongst your female athletes, but yet women in soccer and in a lot of comparable male, female comparable sports report higher rates. Um, can you maybe reconcile that difference? They have fewer impacts, higher number of injuries. Yeah. So this is a, a great point in general of the understanding studied population of female athletes of trying to understand of we consistently see higher uh, injury rates in sports like soccer, basketball that have equivalent rules. Um, and so I think uh, our future research is, is targeted at, at that. And so uh, this actually ties in very well with Abby's work um, of trying to look at common impact mechanisms. Uh, and so it's seeing if there's a difference uh, between males and females and like the number of headers versus the number of contacts with the ground. Uh, and then exploring the magnitude of those impacts. So uh, for example, of player to player contact in the cross of, uh, is that less severe than the impacts that are occurring uh, with the ball? And, you know, with, and especially with male, female of, is a ball impact for a male less magnitude than when it occurs to a female of a uh, bare head. And so uh, that actually ties in very well with some of the work that we did see in our lacrosse work as well. Very cool, very good. Um, Doug, I wanna move, move on to your poster. Um, uh, as always, just phenomenal. Um, can you maybe talk about some of the main takeaways and clinical applications? Um, for some of our clinicians that might be on the session today. Thank, thanks so much, Steve. Yeah, I'll, I'll channel our clinicians as best I can here. You know, when, when they saw these results come up, they were talking about how in this trial, um, they wait for athletes to come in weekly, see them in the clinic. It's a lot of work to get the athlete there and to have the clinic prepared. And we were really seeing um, symptom reports, reports in real time being a leading indicator of when athletes would come in and then actually achieve clinical clearance, which of course is an entirely different thing, but this was a good leading indicator, um, which motivated the team to think about how uh, moving forward, if providers could have their finger on the pulse of their athletes in this way, it could guide their treatment recommendations as they're getting ready for the next time they'll be, they'll be seen in person. And ultimately, if, if we find more evidence that um, aerobic exercise seems to be um, protective following concussion, it might be a chance to, to you know, give that guidance um, earlier than it otherwise would have come. So is, is that the next step in the, in the research agenda is kind of looking more at uh, implementing these findings into clinical practice and, and going down that road? We'll stay tuned for the results of okay. the trial itself. The parent okay. study was testing that hypothesis. Okay. Um, and you know, but, but either way, we see applications for this real-time measurement with this app that we're, we're working with called Recoups. Um, and, and for example, monitoring athletes on varsity sports teams in real time who by convention on many campuses like yours and ours, I think come in daily if they have a concussion just to complete, just to complete the SCAT in person. There, I think there's an opportunity to start to do that um, in real time on the fly and save a lot of bur burden and also you know, prevent possible exasperations right. um, of, of symptoms while using real time monitoring. That's, that's great. I'm, I'm glad to see it moving in that direction. And uh, I can see huge benefit kind of just conceptually um, 
yeah, I, I'm excited to see. I know John and his team, and I know you're part of that team. They're doing great work in Buffalo, so I'll be excited to see what the results look like. So, thanks, um, Trish. I want to kick over to your presentation. Um, so, not not really what I expected, and I don't I don't mean that in a bad way at all. But typically, a lot of the the, the research looking at kind of multiple concussions, we see increased symptom loads, increased durations of recovery. So you're a little bit different here. Can you can you maybe try to tease those two things apart? Sure, yeah. We um, So this uh, study that we did was a pull from EHR records, which, you know, automatically bumps up our sample size. So I think that has a lot to do with um, kind of the similar findings we had. Um, one of the studies that I referenced in my introduction looked at a very similar exam and a very similar po similar similar population um, from our group actually, and found that there were differences. Um, and so looking at the differences between those two, I mean, that was uh, a different type of population. So like this is coming from specialty concussion care clinics. And I think that might speak to the specificity of that population who is seeking care at that level where um, other studies that have kind of looked at these things are either in the athletic training setting or possibly the emergency department setting. Um, also our age range differed a little bit from um, that previous study where they were looking at a broader age range, including patients up to a, as young as seven, um, which may have affected those results. Um, additionally, this examination is, is something that uh, our group is kind of working um, and building and has done a lot of research on kind of establishing reliability and, and the feasibility of implementing it in the clinical settings. And so I think it is a little bit um, unique and, and new, and I think probably adds a lot to the literature, specifically including both visual and vestibular function in a single exam. So I think building um, from this exam itself and, and looking at the specific population may uh, have contributed to those differences. Yeah. Okay, um, I'm starting to get a little short on time, um, getting some behind the scenes signals here. So I'm going to skip to our, uh, skip to Divya. Um, so very interesting stuff. Um, we have independently here done work on driving and on and using FNIR. So it's very cool to see that you've combined those two. Um, Interesting finding though, well, I guess not so interesting, very, sorry, that the right, um, predicted finding, I guess that you have these ongoing kind of subclinical changes on FNIRs, but your clinical driving test is, is basically your, your, uh, your participants are the same. Um, that being said, is, do you have a recommendation or if you were to make a recommendation to a policymaker about duration to withhold somebody from driving after injury, what would you tell them? They perform the same, the same, or they perform the same clinically, but yet you know there's this subclinical thing going on. So uh, let me just make sure I have your question correct. You um, are wondering if, based on this particular study, we could maybe extrapolate some sort of policy or clinical recommendation in terms of um, waiting X amount of time or until this symptom, like until this symptom clears or whatever, um, to refrain from driving. Is that correct? correct? Yep. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think that based on the 12 adolescents that we had in this study, I maybe wouldn't, uh, I maybe wouldn't go so far as to make a policy recommendation. But I do think you're absolutely correct um, that this is a really interesting finding. Uh, our, I didn't mention this while I was talking, but the concussed kids that we did recruit were sort of in that closer to asymptomatic phase. Um, so the average PCSI score was about 12 or 13. Um, and so you're correct in that the, this really is this sort of subclinical deficit. And so um, while I would for sure refrain from saying anything about this number of days or um, this uh, symptom level or whatever it is, I do think that this uh, requires a lot more exploration, um, especially since uh, another paper that came out of our group recently looked at um, adolescents sort of post-injury um, whether or not they were self-reporting returning to driving. And while a majority self-reported that post-injury they had returned to driving, a lot hadn't even been cleared to go back to school yet. And sort of um, my tagline is, you know, AP world is probably just as cognitively taxing as driving. Um, and so I definitely think that this requires a lot more um, investigation. So okay. Great. All right. Um, okay, I want to I want to make sure we get our uh, a question here for our last speaker, Cesar. Um, thank you. Appreciate you uh, uh, dialing in here and, and giving the talk. Um, I think you, you addressed probably a question that 
a lot of people are really interested in it's, uh, you know, exposure to contact sports and long-term cognitive health. Uh, and you found some, you have some interesting findings here. Um, I'll, I'll ask a similar question that I asked Divya. Do you have a policy recommendation or is there something we should need to think about relative to policy that uh, can help uh, eliminate or maybe reduce some of these effects that you're finding? Well, it's uh, interesting too because the recommendations, it's not easy to recommend for other people because in Mexico specifically, the public uh, research or the public uh, recommendation for a concussion event or our TVA record was leaked. Uh, we, had, we don't have a very uh, seriously research and, and the collegiate athletes, uh, the amateur uh, athletes, we don't have um, more times uh, the research, the research, the physical, the the people uh, ready to evaluate after an, a hit impact, after a, a concussion impact. Uh, so we recommend that uh, make an evaluation, an initial evaluation and, and basal evaluation to know what is the general, general conditions for the athlete at the begun and the decision at the begun and the start decision, and know the follow up uh, after three months, six months, one year uh, at the end of the decision to know uh, any change, any any change in the cognitive uh, the performance and on the possible use of your makers as uh, as the APOE to identify any any difference, uh, any change in, in the performance. Uh, maybe uh, well, the conclusion is is different. Is some process uh, dif uh, hard to identify with why are the things on, on symptoms for the athletes, and we even we don't have the research, the the tools, the the software in March times. Uh, it's hard. Okay, we are uh, at the top of the hour, so uh, I want to say thank you uh, to everybody who joined us today for the inaugural Prevention Center Re uh, Research Symposium. Thank you to all of our presenters. Amazing, amazing work. I'm excited to see the next steps that everybody has uh, that will be coming out. Uh, huge thank you to Carrie and Cameron, who uh, were not on camera today, and they are working hard behind the scenes to make sure everything went smoothly, so thank you to them. Uh, as a reminder, everything uh, that was talked about today was recorded. It'll be available on the Injury Prevention Center website in the next week or two. Uh, you'll also be receiving a feedback survey within the next week. Uh, please fill that out to help us to continue to grow and improve this event in future years. Um, if you are not already a member of the Michigan Injury Prevention Center, please go to the website, uh, injurycenter.umich.edu. Uh, you could become a member there, get access to the monthly newsletter, newsletter uh, what publications are coming out, uh, updates, uh, work, and then upcoming events. Uh, we would also encourage you to attend the Suicide Prevention Summit, which will be held virtually March 16th next year. You can uh, RSVP for that event um, on the events page of the Injury Center website. I would also like to mention the Concussion Center here at the University of Michigan. Feel free to visit our website, check us out. We are at concussion.umich.edu. You can follow us on Twitter at UMich Concussion. Uh, we, have, we try to push out all of our latest research, events, uh, and you can go to our website and become a member there. Thank you again for your attendance. Thank you to all of our presenters for their important work on injury prevention, and we hope you have a great rest of your day. Thank you. <laughs>